Please, we'll take our opening prayer from Mr. Tio Quay, the chapter president. Okay. Good evening. Can you bow our heads in prayer? Okay. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given to us to gather together as one family. Although we are meeting online, but we believe that you are with us. Father, we're going to discuss topics about health. And health, good health is one of the things give that you give to your children. Therefore, I pray that let everything that we're going to be done here be in accordance to your will. Lead us, guide us. Jesus, name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Irene Koko, and I'm the National Women's Commissioner of Nux China. And thank you all for joining us for the mental and mental health and breast cancer awareness panel discussion, which is moderated by my very good self. I also want to thank our wonderful panelists um, on this show and also to thank our wonderful organizers for a wonderful program tonight. I would like to also introduce our guest, but before I do that, I would like to check if they are present. Um, Okay, I will not mention their name now. Before I, I, I think I have to skip to the next. Let's let's take a moment while we wait for the rest to join us. Uh, the rest of our panelists to join us. Okay, so I would like to say something. <laughs> we all gathered here tonight for one good reason. And I believe at the end of this program, we will all be in sound minds, gain more insights at the end of the show. And on, especially on how to manage our apple breasts, tender seeds, tender strong, jelly-like bottle, depleted thread-like breasts, all the types that we could think of. As well as, as as far as mental health and breast cancer awareness are concerned. Okay, so while we keep waiting for our special panelists, we'll take um, a, a musical interlude from our organizer. Thank you. Hello, please, can I be heard? Organizer, please give us music while we wait for the panelists to join us. I like a Mongola, cause people like her. I like a Genevieve, I think that she's so sweet. And now you have a worry, cause you know the drink. Up. 
to press, so press now for to press. Mother, which one you choose? I put press now to the fan, I put press now below. I did not know they do the same one. Some breasts are apple breasts, some breasts are bottle breasts. My brother, which one you choose? Apple breasts are standing for now, bottle breasts are below. I did you know they do the same one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ganiza, for wonderful music. All right. We have in our midst, I would like to acknowledge some um, guests among us. Our president is here with us um, in the presence of Colin C and the vice president as well in the person of um, Ben Okwampa, as well as uh, all the rest of the NEC members, um, Mr. Nanadra, the SG, Francisca, and the organizer who just gave us a wonderful music. All right, so straight to introduce uh, important panelists to, for this pep, um, event or purpose of gathering. We have in our midst Dr. Albert Sedo here. He is a specialist psychiatrist, entrepreneur, at Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Double Diamond Associates at Max International. We also have in our midst, Miss Valerie McCarthy Vroom. She is a senior community health nurse. Also um, in our midst, we have Dr. Diana Abobi Kambes. She is also at um, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And our last panelist in our midst we, is in the person of Dr. Ransford Hoya Kwashi. He is also a medical director at Doma East District Hospital. Okay, so before we start with our discussion tonight, I would like to say I would try my very best keeping few notes and also monitoring the chat box to randomly select few questions directed to the panelists for rich insights um, after the discussion as well. Chance will be given to those who would like to give direct questions um, to, by speaking to the panelists at the end of the discussion. And I would also like to, um, we would also like to keep our discussions to close maximum two hours. So I apologize, uh, I'll apologize in advance for not being able to get all of your questions, but I will save them and then I will 
share with uh, panelists in order to email responses to everyone later. Okay, so we'll start with the mental health discussion. And we'll start with uh, our tonight's discussion, we'll start with a uh, mental panel panelist and the person of Dr. Albert Sedo here. Mr. Dr. Albert Sedo here, please tell us much that we need to know about mental health. All right, so um, once again, thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. If you can hear me, uh, can you type mental health? At least if three people could type mental health, I know you can all hear me clearly. I want to be sure you can all hear me clearly so that, yeah, okay, all right. So that means I'm being heard. I'm speaking from Ghana, so it's 12.16 now. So I can say a good afternoon to every one of you. Um, of course, to all the organizers and to my friends who, um, considered me to be giving this honor to share with you on this World Mental Health Day. I'm Dr. Albert Sedoni, a special psychiatrist at Hollywood Teaching Hospital. Um, so I was speaking with my friend Frederick on what exactly he wants me to talk about, and he gave me an idea of what um, is expected of me. I'll keep it very simple and short, but um, to start off with, um, what I want most of you to understand is uh, the knowledge or the awareness of mental, well, mental health is quite on the low side um, on this part of the world. I'm talking Africa. Um, and on a day like this, uh, WHO de decides to use this day as an opportunity to create awareness and also most importantly to advocate um, against stigmatization of mentally ill uh, patients. All right, so I will start off from that angle. Uh, mental health, um, okay, let's start from health uh, as defined by WHO. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social. It's PMS, physical, mental, and social well-being, which means if you, don't have, if you have a mental illness, you're not healthy. If you have a physical illness, you're not healthy. If you have a social illness, like you don't have money in your pockets, you're not healthy. So all of this comes together to make the human being healthy or not healthy. And it's not just the mere absence of disease or illness, no. So, it goes, so mental health is very important. So what again then is then, what is mental health? It's a state, it involves your emotions, your psychological well-being, your emotional well-being, and your social well-being. That's what mental health involves. And on a day like this, in Ghana, uh, what we are using this day to promote, since I'm speaking from Ghana, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the Mental Health Authority, Ghana, and of course, speaking as a worker from Kolebu Teaching Hospital, what we are using to promote is to decriminalize suicide, to decriminalize suicide. And today I woke up at dawn and I was just, you know, inspired to write some things on my Facebook wall. My name is Albert Sedunia on Facebook, you are going to check it out. In, in Ghana, when somebody attempts suicide, of course, if you, are, if you, if you commit suicide, I mean, that means you, you were successful, so you'll not, you not be alive for anybody to prosecute you. But in Ghana, when somebody attempts suicide, and of course, fortunately, of course, fortunately, because he's still alive, life is very important. Fortunately, doesn't succeed, the police goes to pick you up, and you're prosecuted, and you may be jailed, all right? And that is 100% wrong, all right? Today is World Mental Health Day, and we are trying to bring all our voices together to inform the authorities to decriminalize suicide. What we are trying to say is that when someone attempts suicide, and fortunately for us, he or she does not succeed, the person should not be picked up by the police. That, is not the, that should not be the first point of call. It is the mental health workers or hospital should be the first point of call, all right? So if you're on the call, and you agree with me that we, should, we need to decriminalize suicide, I want you to just type it gently. Decriminalize suicide now. I want this chart to be 
quite interactive. I like it to be interactive. Okay, um, if you agree with me that uh, the authority should decriminalize suicide, just type it in a comment section briefly for me, decriminalize suicide now. And thank you very much for the support. And I will explain why, I will explain why. The reason is before somebody tries to commit suicide, something would have triggered something, all right? Something would have triggered. That is why I chose to talk about one of the commonest mental health illnesses that we see in our practice in Ghana, in Kolebu, and that is mood disorders. Uh, notable among them is we have depression. Depression, depression, depression. And I'm also informed that most of you on the call are students. Of course, I have my colleague doctors. I salute all colleagues on the call. Uh, I see you all doctors. I see you colleagues and seniors. I see you all. Um, I'm told most of you are students. So I'm going to a bit tailor the, my short message to you know, uh, appeal to you better. So I'm going to talk, talk about mental health, but I just to zoom in a bit on depression. Depression is quite very common, and it's actually, it's a mental health in general is closer than you think. I, in a bit to destigmatize de, de, de mental health, let me explain something to you. Mental health is closer to you, the one listening to me, than you ever thought. Now, if you go to your family genealogy, you would have heard or seen or have been told of someone who might have had something to do with mental illness in the past. Most often than not, they don't talk about it because people are ashamed to be seek help for such people. Sometimes ourselves, we may suffer some stresses that may precipitate some mental health illnesses, but because we don't want to be tagged or stigmatized as such, we shield it and we don't want anybody at all to know about it. You may know a friend, a family, a relative, anyone at all who have certain symptoms that may suggest there is something that a person needs help for. So I'm just here to help you be able to recognize generally mental health illnesses, but I'll zoom in on depression. So depression um, is different from sadness. Depression is different from sadness. And let me explain this. Sadness is an emotional state, most often than not, it is temporary. For example, you are holding money, you are holding $100 bill, and I'm using dollars so that everybody who is on the call can understand. I'm a Ghanaian, proud one. Um, you're holding a $100 bill and you misplace it. Once you misplace it, the emotional feeling that you go through is called sadness. It's you are reacting to your loss, all right? That is sadness. Why is it sadness and why am I saying it is temporary? Because if I should find that your $100 bill and bring it to you right now, you're going to be excited, you're going to be jubilating, you're going to be happy and be grateful and be thankful, right? That is sadness. That is not depression. Depression, the emotional state of depression is far deeper and more sustaining, we call it more pervasive than just sadness. Yes, people who are depressed, who are going to depression, they feel sad, but, but their sadness is more pervasive and it's deeper. It's not about they lost something and if that thing is brought back, they're gonna be okay, no. And it's not just about feeling sad, it has to be for a duration of time. And the minimum duration that we allow is at least, the person should be feeling sad and would have lost interest in things that he or she used to like for at least two weeks. So if you're following the discussion and you're listening to what I'm saying, type two weeks. So if somebody loses a friend or money or some property and is feeling sad, it is temporary. It's very, very reactionary. And when the person is helped, the sadness will go away. But depression is a serious illness. It's so serious that it has a lot and a lot of complications, all right? So I want to let help you to identify someone who has depression. And once I'm going through the list, trust me when I say this, either you, have, you are going through it yourself, or you know someone who may probably be going through it, or you have gone through it before, or you will, it will help you be able to be well positioned to be able to pick up or tell if somebody is possibly going through a state of depression, all right? So for people who have depression, the cardinal symptoms, they will feel sad. And I said the sadness is not because they've lost something or not, it's, it's more deep. They feel more deep, deeply sad compared to you losing some coins or something. All right, and the things that they used to like, some people like to watch football, some like to read books, some like to read, to, to read novels, write books, some like to watch movies. 
you will lose interest in those things. And we call it anhedonia. Forget about the technical term. But the person will be feeling sad, deeply sad, and then will be losing interest in things that they used to love in the past. That person excitedly would have been, you know, watching movies in their free time, reading books. But when you see that person, he's no more interested in any of those ones. And also sometimes they cry with a little provocation. Sometimes with nothing at all, just be sitting down and be thinking deep thoughts and they just start crying. So feeling sad, loss of interest of things that you used to like. And another thing very, very critical is they begin to feel hopeless, as if there is no hope for them in this life. They begin to feel helpless. There is no source of help. They feel, that's what they are feeling. When somebody has a mental illness, whatever he or she is feeling, don't argue with the person. Because the person is feeling it. It's not you who is feeling the thing. So you won't understand. You also just take it and seek help for the person. That's why awareness is very important. When you see somebody with a suspected mental health illness, you also just to seek help on behalf of the person. Because most often they are not. When they are going through that period, they are not even aware of what is going on. All right? So feeling sad, loss of interest in things that you used to love, also feel hopeless, helpless, and a very key cardinal symptom, which is they feel worthless. They feel life is not worth living. That is where they begin to entertain suicidal ideation. Suicidal ideation meaning they want to possibly take their life. Sometimes it is passive, sometimes it is active. Passive in the sense that they know taking life according to their belief is a sin, but they wish something could just happen and they will die. It's also a serious symptom. And some of them have suicidal ideation and some go as far as attempting to take their life. Some successful, and those who attempt and be successful, mostly they are men. The women attempt more than men, but men, their attempts are more successful than women. That is where the statistics lie. So All right, so when, when, whenever you, or you, you are told of someone who have feelings sad, lots of interest in things they used to like, crying spells, crying spells, um, hopelessness, worthlessness, and having suicidal ideation, feeling like they, they want to take their own life because life is not worth living. And in addition, you become forgetful, there will be poor concentration, and some of them may lose a lot of weight. Some may gain weight. That's the atypical depression. And most of them may not be able to eat, but some of them may even overeat. Again, the atypical depressive uh, cases. So generally speaking, that is what how depression presents. And um, now let's come to practicality. Students, among students, among colleague workers, how would you be able to tell a colleague or a, a friend has possibly a mental illness or maybe a depression? So this is someone who always comes to work early or comes to class early or is always on time or whatever. But all of a sudden, you're beginning to notice the person is no more as he or she used to be. The person is no more as sharply dressed, neatly dressed as he or she used to be. The person is no more engaging in conversation with friends and family as he or she used to be. The person is no more interested in things that you guys enjoy together. And the person always seems to be lost in thoughts. Always just going, hmm, hmm. And sometimes, most often than not, the person will be giving negative comments. This life cry, what is it? What, what, what are we even fighting for? Going to school for so many years, what is going to happen? Are we not all going to die? Uh, Jesus is going to come and we are going to go to heaven. So why are we suffering like that? Such negative comments are signals. It's like, I call it a call out for help. Now we are in the age of social media. So you have some friends who are always loud on social media, very active on social media. And all of a sudden, they are no more there. You don't see their posts. You don't see their comments. You don't see their reactions to your posts, anything. Your aim, your duty as a friend, as a relative, as a colleague, a good one at that is to reach out and find out what's happening to them. Because most of the people who attempted suicide and fortunately failed, when they were interviewed, they admit that at the point they're about to commit suicide, and I have interviewed a lot of those people, most of them at the point they're about to commit, the point they're about to commit suicide, the point they're about to commit a suicide, something happens. I had a very popular uh, celebrity in this country. Of course, psychiatrist confidentiality is our top notch. Very popular person. The person said, whether he or she, I won't, I won't mention, the person said at the point he, he took the gun to, the, to a place to go and kill, the, the person wanted to kill, take his or her own life. But at that point, a young child 
just shouted the person's nickname. And when he, he or she had the nickname, it was like, hmm, somebody knows me. If I die now, somebody's going to miss me. That was the saving point. There are a lot of people who will tell you that they were about to just drink the poison and then a call came through. That call was a distraction. Then somebody called them. Somebody walked into the, the room. Somebody had put a rope up the ceiling and was about to hang himself. And then somebody opened the door and then they stopped. They didn't do it again. So at that point, they are just calling out for help. So if you see a friend, all of a sudden, all his Facebook or Instagram posts or social media posts are negative. Or the person is no more even engaged or active on social media. Please be a good help. Be a good friend. Reach out to that person. It's a call out for help. These days, because of westernization of our culture, our extended family system, we are losing it. So the social support that we use, you know, those days you could be at home and your grandmother would just pass by and say, I just came by to say hello without informing you, without pre-informing you. So it means that they want to find out what they've not heard from you for two or three days a week. They just pass by. But these days you could go a whole year and maybe your own mom, you've not spoken to her. That's how serious that we are lacking the social fabric that put us together, that protect us against some of these things. So those are some of the things I used to pick up somebody who, are, who possibly, I'm not saying it is a depression. All you are supposed to do if you are not a mental health worker is to be able to suspect that this person could be suffering from a mental health illness. And that's it. And then you seek help on behalf of the person because when they are going through the thing, there is something very important that I nearly left out. When they are depressed, they have what we, we, they, they have low energy, low self-esteem. Do you understand? Low energy. So they will not even be able to want to go to the hospital to seek help. Even though they were appreciated, some of them would have appreciated if somebody took them to the hospital, they themselves don't have the drive. Evolution. They call it evolution. They don't have the drive to even go to the hospital. Some of them don't have the drive to even bath or take care of them, their own hygiene. Some don't have the drive to cook, so they don't eat, they don't bath, they don't take care of their hygiene. So a lot of things come to play when the person is suffering from this. Why did I bring depression in? I bring depression in because one of the commonest causes of suicide globally, and of course in Ghana as well, suicide. It's one of the commonest causes. Now, we're coming back to mental health illness. Everyone is at risk. If you're on the call and you are following the call so far, you can type with me for me to know you're following me. Type, everyone is at risk. That's what we call predisposition. Everyone is at risk. Everyone is at risk. The things that precipitate the mental, Ill, the mental uh, illnesses, most often they're not as stresses, stress. Stress from your workplace, stress from family, stress from a lot of financial lack of money, stress from all angles. Stress can precipitate it. Chronic illnesses, of course, that also leads to stress, can also precipitate mental health illnesses. Accident, trauma, also that is also stress, can also precipitate mental health illnesses. So anybody can suffer from it. And when I'm saying that is, we have lawyers, engineers, doctors, nurses, students, presidents, we have who have mental illness. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having mental illness. It's just like having a physical illness, hypertension or diabetes. It's the same. All you need to do is to seek help. And when there is a need for medication, we give you medication. You come for your regular reviews and you are just like everybody else. There is no difference. Somebody might ask, what actually causes those mental illnesses? Don't worry yourself too much about the details. But what it means is it's because of chemical imbalances in your brain. We call them neurotransmitters. Those are the things that causes mental illnesses. So anybody can suffer depression. Anybody can suffer any form of psychosis. Anybody can suffer anxiety disorder. And when I'm talking about, after I've talked about mood disorders, depression, there is another one which is called bipolar disorder. We call it bipolar affective disorder, where the person has a high mood and a low mood and in between like that. Um, it happens, that's bipolar. Most of us are, are uh, conversation with that one. Then we have anxiety disorders. You, you see that feeling you feel when you are going to write exams, right? Where you have, your heart is beating and you are sweating and you, like, you are afraid you may fail or you, may, you know, you're not sure of what you're going to do and you are racing thoughts. 
anxiety. That is anxiety, typical of anxiety feeling. But again, that one too, there has to be enough duration of time for you to be experiencing that before we can call it an anxiety disorder. Okay, that one is also a mental illness. We have psychosis. And psychosis, um, typically, the, the two major symptoms that you can use to tell what somebody is suffering from psychosis, uh, of course, I'm just creating general awareness of mental illnesses, is when a person has delusions. Delusions are the person's very strong belief that he or she will hold on to despite contrary evidence. So the person believes strongly, let me give you a typical example. The person believes strongly that somebody or some group of people are plotting evil against him or her. That's one. The person strongly believes that people are talking about him or her. That's another one. The person strongly believes that people are monitoring him or her through his or her phone, the TV. The person believes it. Even if it gives contrary evidence, the person believes it. That's delusions, all right? Or sometimes we have some we have what we call delusions of guilt, where the person believes that he or she has wronged everybody. So he or she goes about begging everybody for forgiveness with no offense of, uh, at all. He just goes about begging everybody. So that's delusions for you to suspect psychosis. And then that one is hallucinations. Hallucinations is when you feel things in your senses that are actually not there, but you feel it, you see it, you smell it, you taste it. So we have auditory hallucination. You hear voices like through your ears, even though nobody is talking to you, but you hear it. You see things, visual hallucinations. You smell things that may not be there, really. You taste things, gastric. So those are also the, in all the five senses of the human, that's the five senses of humans. You feel, taste, smell, and all these things, see things which are not there. That's hallucinations. Now, again, when the person says, I hear voices, don't argue with them, but don't tell them it's not real. It is real to the person. All you need to do is seek help for the person. Most often, the another common symptom is uh, auditory hallucination, that's hearing voices. Most often, when it starts, this is how it starts. The person will just tell you, I hear somebody call my name behind me. When I turn, I don't see anybody. That's how mostly it may present, auditory hallucination. For the visual hallucinations, mostly when somebody has visual hallucinations, uh, there may be more causes of the person's problem, okay? The uh, physicians and the neurosurgeons will understand, which is there may be organic causes of his or her problem. So we've talked about mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychosis in general, but there are eating disorders and other ones. And of course, there's anxiety disorder. We have the post-traumatic stress disorder. This is also quite common. And how do they commonly present? somebody who has suffered some form of trauma in the past and the commonest form of trauma that goes unreported who can guess what it is the commonest form of trauma that goes unreported against females who can guess what it is let me see if people are on the call exactly Gloria heart. Pabla. Well is it broken heart no it's rape rape hey, hey. rape it Hello. goes unreported for broken hearts for broken heart, they will tell all their friends the guy has jilted them. Everybody will hear about it. But a commonest form of trauma that goes unreported. So let me tell you a very staggering statistic, which is one out of every four females would have suffered some form of sexual assault in their life. That is very scary, isn't it? One out of every four females. They don't talk about it, so people don't know. And another scary thing is, the people who perpetuate this sexual assault are actually close relatives. It could be their own parents, I mean, their own father, their uncles, their own brothers, their cousins. It could be their um, uh, uh, a, a caregiver, a house help, somebody very close. And when the, the action is perpetrated, they are warned not to, not, to, not to tell anybody that if they do, they will die. And as children or young and naive and uh, somehow, uh, powerless, they may hold on to these things and it affects them in the long run. They may have lots of other psychiatric conditions that may come out of this. Another thing that is about post-traumatic stress disorder is people who go through like serious trauma, like war, and also maybe some, some very bad divorce in the family where the, mom, the man and the woman, they are against each other like that and the children are in the middle. 
So post-traumatic, that's after the trauma has occurred, so many six months or one year or two years ago, you made them be suffering the thing. How does it present? The person doesn't, the person always has flashbacks. So let's go to the rape. The lady who has been raped before, will always be reliving the, the bad experience, the painful experience of the rape. Everything that happened, she will be going through it. And please mind you, boys are also raped. So it's both ways, all right? So the, the person will be really... Living that experience, that traumatic experience we call flashbacks. And there's something called avoidant behavior. So you have a, a, your daughter at home, and there is this particular uncle when he comes to the house. Your daughter doesn't want to go to that uncle. You don't understand why. But the uncle says, oh, I like your daughter. But the daughter says, I don't like this uncle. You two, you don't understand. You think your daughter is being, you know, self food. The daughter says, I don't want to serve my uncle. Something might have happened. Avoidant behavior. They don't want to take experience. So flashback. So, um, avoidant behavior. These are some of the key things that the person will present with. Now, all I'm saying is there are mood disorders, psychosis, and know about it. So, like, when you are experiencing any of these symptoms, please know that there is help for you. Just walk into any hospital, there is always a mental health unit. We have decentralized mostly. There is always a mental health unit. Go there and you will be attended to. We work hand in hand with psychologists for psychotherapy and other, and of course, occupational therapies and a host of others to restore you. Just like hypertensives are giving medications and procedures and all that to restore them, we do the same for you. So no not to make my talk too long. I think I've spoken quite at length. I think I've touched on almost everything. Our, uh, our fight, our, our voice that we are putting together in Ghana is to decriminalize suicide. To commit suicide was feeling sad, loss of interest, suicidal ideation, feeling hopeless, helpless, and worthless, and then decided, now that person needs psychological support, mental health support, and not to be punished by way of imprisonment. No, the person needs help. So the first point of course should not be the police station, should be the hospital. That is what we are asking for. So that when anybody gets to see somebody do that, you bring the person to the hospital instead of reporting to the police. All right. So so thank you very much. Um, actually, when Fred approached me, I told him I have a program right now out. So um, I'll be going on contact Fred or any of you. Those of you can take, let me just type in in the comments. I don't know if I can comment. Let me see, comment over chat, okay. I'm just dropping my contact in the comment section. Chat me on WhatsApp instead of, um, instead of calling. I don't pick calls too, too often, all right? So um, I'm sending my contact to Ernest, your president, uh, yeah, so that he can make it available. I don't know if I can send it to everyone. I don't know, but we, we, we are available. Mental health workers, we want to be available to everybody who needs help, but we know you are just a call away from saving you from taking your own life, but there is help. So I'm Dr. Albert Sadu here, um, socialist psychiatrist. We are open arm, willing to help you with your mental health challenges. Please feel free and reach out and let us help you. We are all over the country. Uh, let's all have a happy and a successful World Mental Health Day. And I hope by end of today, by end of the week, the month, the states would have heard our voice to decriminalize suicide because we've been at it for a long time. Thank you very much for the audience. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Um, we would like to take, for the sake of time and you having other appointments, we would like to take questions from the audience and um, quickly you address it for us, then you take your leave. Okay, to special audience, kindly um, give our input for doctor to address them for us. Um, if you have any question, you could, you know, raise your hand for me to allow you to 
give your input or you type your question in the text box. Okay, Miss Ali. Yeah. Please, you could ask the question. Okay, good evening. And thank you, sir. Please, my question is, during the lockdown, a friend of mine had a mental issue, got raped and then got pregnant. So now she has two problems to deal with. How can you help such a person? Must she go to the hospital for, uh, I don't know how to say it, for mental something, something that you were talking about, or is there anything else that can be done for her? Yes, like I said, anyone with any mental Ill illness should first of for the first point of call is the hospital. So let your friend, of course, we are sorry for the ordeal. Um, so that's why we are we always advocating for the rights of the mentally ill because they are vulnerable, just like children, pregnant women, and elderly are vulnerable. Mentally ill people are also very vulnerable. And be remind, be mindful. Anyone can suffer mental illness. So don't see yourself special. Mm -mm. Anyone can suffer it at any point in time. So let your friend go to the hospital. They assess and know what mental uh, illness the person has, and they know how best to manage it. And then at that point, a decision will be taken as to what to do with the pregnancy. We cannot make that decision here on air. We have to decide with consultation with caregivers and all put together. So hospital is the first point of call. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, the next person is NS Chendu President. Please give your submission. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, doc, you're most welcome. This is your uh, mentee. Uh, I would like to find out the observation time if you suspect uh, a case. Should we refer the person directly or we have to give some duration to monitor the features that you just mentioned? Thank you. That's a very good question. It's a smart question. See, the moment you suspect somebody could possibly be suffering from mental illness or any form of ill health at all, yours is to reach out. Get close to the person. Find out if what you are suspecting is a possibility. Maybe you see somebody talking to him or herself. You see somebody always sad, crying, or somebody who is not him or herself anymore as you used to know the person. Just get close and find out, my brother, my sister, is there a problem? Just by talking to the person, you can then be able to deduce if the person has some issues or not. And if the person does have some issues by your suspicion, you advise that you go to the hospital to see the, 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 the doctor. Or possibly, you inform the person's parents or caregivers or friends to also help together with yourself to go to see the doctor. Don't give any duration that you're going to wait to see if the person will become worse or not. No. The time you suspect, act now. That's what we always advise. All right? All right. Thank you very much, Doc. The well, follow-up question. The indirect approach and direct approach. Maybe I suspect somebody, but the procedure for me to go to that person, I have to give the information to somebody in order for the person to disclose the details. Uh, is that the best way or I should ask the one who has discovered the issue to proceed? Or I should go directly or to pass it? Okay, that's why. Because some other people, when you okay, go to the person, the, the person will not talk to you. Yeah, I know. So that's why I'm saying that once you suspect the person, get close to the person. You know, you should, you should also respect the person's privacy. You can't just be walking yes. around claiming that you are holier than thou and everybody else is, you know what I'm saying? So get close to the person, become the person's friend. If he's already your friend, you can let him know, oh, Kojo, or oh, my friend, I see these days you don't watch football as you used to. You don't come around boys, boys as you used to. Is there a problem? Is there something you are going through that you want to share with me? Sometimes when they offload their problems to you and you guys talk about it, it helps them. All right? Uh-huh. So you just have to get close to them. If you are not close to the person at all, at all, at all, at all you can get close to somebody who is close to the, pe the, the person and say, let's find out if Kojo is going through some stress. You are not allowed to go and say, Kojo has a mental illness. Let's take him to the hospital. You don't know yet. You are not a specialist. You are not a professional. You don't go labeling anybody. You just say, 
I think there's a problem with Kojo. I think there's something that he may be going through. Can we find out? And then seek help together with the person's consent. And sometimes they don't give you consent, but once you have a relative or caretaker's consent, you can always seek help for them. All right, thank you very much, Doc. I'm most grateful. Okay, welcome. Thank, thank you, Doc, for the good answer. Please, we, we have um, Sir Monk to give us his question. Then I'll move to the questions in the chat box, maybe one or two, then we'll move to the next um, panel discussion. Hello, Doc. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Your good friend here, Cyril. Um, I want to find out, is there any correlation between stress and mental health? Yes, there's a direct link. Stress can predispose you to mental illnesses. Stress can precipitate mental illness. Stress can perpetuate mental illnesses. Three different things they can do. Somebody who may not can predispose you to suffering it manifested yet, the stress that a person is going through will precipitate the mental illness. Somebody who's already going through some mental health issues, the stress, the presence of the stress can perpetuate the mental illness. So stress is a killer, a silent one for that matter. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Please, there's one question from, um, for you. The person said, Doc, please, I want to know if traumatic situations like accidents can cause mental illness. Yes, it can. Okay. Then a uh, follow-up question from, an, um, not follow up, a follow-up question, but it's a question. Doc, please, I would like to know if there has been re recorded cases of uh, um, DID in Ghana and how well you guys treat it. Hello, Doc. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Very sorry, very sorry, very sorry, very sorry. Yeah, you said, I, I'm, I'm reading the question. You said, if, if there are recorded cases of DID is dissociative identity disorder. That's what he's trying to say. He must be a mental health personnel uh, in Ghana. Yes, there have been cases of dissociative uh, identity disorder. And then, um, yes, there have been examples of that. Mostly, if there are psychotic symptoms, you, you add an uh, antipsychotic, but mostly it's psychotherapy, um, occupational therapy, and any form that is indicated. It's a specialist level management. So, yes, there have been cases like that. That, that the management depends on the presentation. And mostly, of course, if there are psychotic symptoms, you give antipsychotics. Um, if there's the need for occupational rehabilitation, of course, you do that. All right. So it's dissociative identity. Yeah, that's what he, he's trying to say. Okay. Thank you. I think that's, um, that was our last question. And I think that there's another. Okay. I think that's the last question for you so thank you very much uh very good. thank you very much thank you very much so um again i'm leaving my contacts some people were asking me about my contacts like i said don't call you can just whatsapp me let me know you met on this call all right so that we uh, just chat me and when i have time we'll re i'll reach out and all right so let's all have a nice and a successful world mental health day and let's all stay safe and the sense of community should continue to be there. Check up on your friends and friends, check up on your friends as well. All right. Have a nice day. Okay. All right. Thank you, Doug. Before we move to our next panel discussion, I would like to recognize um, a very important person who really helped organize the, the panelists for today's discussion and the person of um, Mr. Fred 
um, Mr. Fred, welcome and thank you very much for the wonderful organization. All right, so I'll introduce the panelist for our next discussion, um, Dr. Okay, so um, Dr. Diana Bobi Kambins, um, Mrs. Valerie McCarthy Bloom. Um, they are going to, and then Dr. Ransford Hoya Kwachi, they are going to be uh, panelists for the, the new for the new for discussion. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> Okay, thank you, Agana. Okay, so I'll start with our first um, panelist in the person of Mrs. Valerie McCarthy Room. Um, Mrs. Valerie McCarthy Room, can you tell us a bit of what important thing that we have to know uh, all about the NUFO, the Breast Cancer Awareness? Thank you. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Good evening. Um, I am Valerie McCarthy Broom. I'm a senior community health nurse at Adana Health Center, and I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to interact with you know everyone here on this platform. Um, we, um, as we all know, the month October is here and the month October is a month that has been set aside to create awareness on breast cancer. But first of all, we, we all have to understand what um, cancer is. So um, in order to make um, this whole talk um, an interactive one, like Dr. Albert said initially, um, I think um, we can all type cancer so that, or something like breast cancer so that we then I know that we are all on track, right? So um, cancer, um, cancer is a large group of, you know, it's a large group of diseases that attacks what? The organs of a body, you understand? A large group, or let me say abnormal cells that attacks what the organs of the body and breast cancer. The cancer can affect any part of the body. So, today we are solely talking about the um, breast cancer or the breast. So, breast cancer is when abnormal cells do what attacks or invades the what the normal cells within the breast. You understand? And some of the signs and symptoms we have to know is looking out for lumps in the breast, tenderness of the breast. It is important that we observe the shape of our breast too. You know, every lady should be able to know how the breast looks like. If you're a lady and you don't have the mirror in your room, then I'll be like, I'll be so surprised. Everybody should get a mirror and at least try and what, observe the breast to know if there is a change in the breast. So you observe for lumps, you observe for tenderness, if there are holes on your breast or any discharge coming from the nipples. If you press the nipple and you realize that there's a discharge coming out, you should immediately do what? Report to the nearest facility, okay? So let me quickly take us through the um, you through the theme for um, this year, 2020, for breast cancer. That is, um, we are detecting, treating, and then defeating, according to World Health Organization. So early detection is very, very key here. Early detection is very key. So in this month, we are all, you know, wearing the pink to portray, like, I mean, every year and every month of what, October, everyone is supposed to wear what, um, the pink to, you know, exhibit or create awareness about the breast cancer 
using the um, pink ribbons to raise funds to support people who have been affected by the breast cancer. And then self-examination. It's very important, ladies. It's very important that immediately you are done with your menses, like maybe a week or some few days after your menses, you examine your breast to see if there are some changes. And it's important to also rest, have enough rest and sleep. It's, it's very key, like Dr. Albert said, rest and sleep is also good. And we also have to exercise, exercise a lot because some of us, our eating habits is very bad. A lot of ladies like eating junk, a whole lot of fatty meals and stuff like that. They all contribute to, you know, breast cancers. You understand? So it's important to exercise. It's important to drink a lot of water. And this one to um, avoiding what? Excessive intake of what? Alcohol. Avoiding excessive intake of alcohol. And we have to allow the married ones, please, we have to allow our um, husbands to what? To suckle our breasts. It's very important to allow. If I say the men should suckle the breast, it doesn't mean they should be biting, you know, the nipples, they should mishandle the breast. No, that one is wrong. Yeah, if, 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 if you if, if you a lady and your husband is mishandling your breast, you have every right to you know, tell him, express your feelings that, hey, daddy or husband, you are, you are hurting me. So please, can you do it in a gentle way, in a romantic way? You understand. Uh -huh. So please, we can allow the men to, you know, circle the breast, but they shouldn't bite with their teeth on the nipples. If not, there will be wahala. Uh -huh, there'll be wahala. And also the 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 brightest, the brightest with wires under them, it's 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 not you know it's not the best. Because I've examined or like I've interviewed like two or three pregnant women who complain about chest pains and all of that. And I I, I asked them the kind of brightest they use, and they tell me the the they use the one with the wires under. So I one day took uh, one one of uh, one client's brazier and I tried bringing out the wire and you'll be so amazed you'll be so amazed so um, I think all these things are contributing factors so if you are able to take critical good care of ourselves of our breasts our breasts should matter to us I'm sure at the end of the day we will we'll all succeed in what combating the you know breast cancer so I think we should all join hands, or we should all come together and defeat breast cancer. Early detection is treatable, and it's mostly common in women. You understand? Some men do get the cancer of the breast, especially the men with, you know, the feminine hormones. They sometimes get breast cancer, but it's more dominant in women. So I think we should all come on board. Uh, examine and self-examination is very important and so that we can detect early and then get our treatment and be safe, okay? We need our women because according to World Health Organization, every year about 4,000 women are being diagnosed of what? Breast cancer. And about 2,000 women also die of breast cancer every year. And as I'm speaking, I am speaking from Ghana, Adafo. There's one teacher who has died this year as a result of breast cancer. So my dear ladies, breast cancer is treatable. So let us, let us detect it early so that we can be able to what, defeat it. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valerie. So we move to Dr. Diana. Um, she's from Kolebu Teaching Hospital. She's going to give us more insight, throw more light on the very important key um, notes when it comes to breast cancer awareness. Doctor, please um, take us through. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm Diana Abobi Kambex. I'm a resident with the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics in Kulebu Teaching Hospital. 
So we'll just go, I'll just say something briefly about breast cancer as it has already been mentioned by uh, Ms. Valerie. So she already talked about what cancer is. So what cancer is, I'll just go briefly, let's take cancer in general. We all have cells. Every part of our body has cells. It's the cells that come together, that forms the organs that we have. So the breast is a, an organ, or let's say tissue. The breast is an organ, so it contains a lot of cells. And these cells continue to divide. They continue to divide. In medical terms, we say they repl repl replicate. So when there is abnormal division, of the cells, it doesn't follow the usual cell cycle, then it results in what we call cancer. So that goes to say that any part that you have cells and cell divisions takes place, you can have cancer occurring. That is if there's an abnormal uh, 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 growth, that means it's not following the normal, the normal, so there's, it's abnormal, then it causes cancer and that cancer is capable of spreading to other parts of the body. And so, as we all know, October has been set aside worldwide as the pink month and the breast cancer awareness month. It's also a month for liver cancer, but today our focus is on breast cancer. And uh, so now that we know what cancer is, uh, we want to know what causes breast cancer. So there is no particular cause for breast cancer. We cannot say this thing causes cancer. Let's take you have uh, malaria. We know that uh, when you are uh, uh, plasmodium parasites and it's being transmitted through the female anopheles mosquito, maybe it bites you, then you know you get malaria. But when it comes to breast cancer, we don't have a particular thing we just say this causes cancer. However, we have things that we say are uh, risk factors to uh, developing cancer. That means they predispose you to getting cancer, even though anyone can get cancer. So that means, uh, let me even go back and say, everyone can get cancer. So it's not only for females. Once you have breast tissues, you can get cancer. So females can get cancer. Males too can get cancer because males do have breast tissue, even though it's not as much as female, the breast tissue is not as much as females do. So males can have cancer and then the females too can have cancer. So what are some of the things that can predispose you to having cancer? I want to divide it to what we we'll term as modifiable and non-modifiable. Modifiable means you can do something about it. Non-modifiable means there is nothing you can do about that risk. So let's go to the uh, non-modifiable risk factors. Some things, there's nothing you can do about it. One, being a female, you can't do anything about it. You are born a female, and once you're a female, you are at a higher risk of having cancer. So females, we are at a hundred times higher risk of developing cancer than our male counterparts. Then we go to age, advancing age. Once you are living, you grow. And once you will get to the age of 40 and above, you, your risk of getting cancer is high, even though we have, you can get it before that. But the risk is very higher amongst women who are 40 and above. Then when it comes to research has shown that the Caucasians or the whites are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer than us. And your race, there's nothing you can do about your race too you are at a higher risk. Now we have certain genes, the genetic predisposition. So we have certain genes that can also, if you have them, makes, puts you also at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. And I will just briefly, it's not just for you to know, but we have the BRCA1 and 2 genes in particular. We have others like the P53. So if you have them, then you are also at, at a higher risk of getting breast cancer. Now I'm talking about the genetic predisposition. That now makes a family history of breast cancer. That means if someone in your family has breast cancer, and uh, that means you are at risk. And now I'm coming to that. It doesn't mean that you go and anyone in your family having who has had breast cancer before puts you at a risk. It is how close that person is to you. So when you take 
the uh, from we have first degree that is your ma uh, your mother uh, your father and then your siblings your immediate siblings they are your first degree then you go to your second degree where you have your aunties and other cousins and so when you have first degree relatives if a first degree relative has had it so if your mother has had breast cancer or your sister has breast cancer then you are at a higher risk of also developing breast cancer and the risk even goes on to the number of relatives that are having the cancer. So if you have uh, uh, in your family, only one person has it, and another family, you realize that almost uh, uh, about four or five of them have cancer, the breast cancer, then that means the person who has more relatives is at a higher risk than the other. Who, uh, 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 than the other. Then, the, so those are in brief are the non-modifiable risk factors. There's nothing you can do about it. Then we come to the things that are modifiable and uh, some of the modifiable, I'll talk about uh, nulliparity. That means uh, women who have not delivered at all. Sometimes I don't know whether to put that as modifiable or non-modifiable because sometimes it's not really the, uh, your wish that you, you don't you might not have delivered. So a woman who has not delivered at all it has a higher risk than women who have had children. And then uh, women who also have children at an, a later age. That means you haven't delivered your first delivery or successful like delivery, carrying pregnancy to term and delivering is uh, uh, maybe if you are uh, delivering at, uh, above the age of 35, you are at a higher risk too of developing breast cancer. And then breastfeeding. Uh, women uh, who uh, do not breastfeed uh, are also at a, a, distant, a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Then we have uh, obesity. If your uh, body mass index you are overweight, and with that one, it happens when you are in your postmenopausal state, not when you are premenopausal. So when you get to menopause, after menopause, if you have, you are obese then you have a higher risk and it is because of the associated high levels of estrogen, because of the adipose tissue, which is converted to estrogen, you have a lot of it. And then you are also at risk of getting breast cancer. Now we also have women that are on hormone replacement therapy and usually are those that are monopausal. If you are having that, you also have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Other risks also is the uh, uh, smoking and taking alcohol. So these things will predispose you to getting breast cancer. And so uh, what do you do when you have this? We've talked about the thing for this year's section is PAP. And for breast cancer, we need to detect it very early. So when you go through this, you realize that everyone, especially every female, it has, it's at risk of getting what cancer because once you live long, you will be above the age of 40, you get to you become menopausal, and then even let's leave the other ones, then you are at risk of getting breast cancer. So we need early detection. And the early detection is what self-examination. One of the ways you can detect it is what self-examination. So you can examine and we advise that you do that monthly. That is after your menses a few days, as um, Ms. Valerie mentioned, is when we advise, because during and then getting close to your menses, we have certain breast changes. So we advise that you do that immediately after your menses. Also, the other thing uh, you can do with that is also to at least get a qualified health professional to examine your breast at least every year. And that is why October is set aside. So we are doing it every month, but once it's October, every woman, it is advised that you go and seek, uh, you go to a health, uh, 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 you get a healthcare professional to uh, thoroughly what examine your breast. We also have other investigations we do because those investigations even help detect the presence of a lamp even before you can fill it like that before when you uh, examine yourself you're able to fill it so we we'll have the breast ultrasound scan that is done and we have a mammogram we usually will recommend women below the ages of 40, 50 to do the breast ultrasound scan because they have a lot of what tissue 
and then the older women will have to do a mammogram. So some do yearly mammography or breast ultrasound scan to detect it. So you look at your rigs and then you start, and we will usually start uh, uh, these scans uh, from the age of 40, uh, you can start it. But when you, have, you are at a higher risk, you even start, some start at the, as early as the age of what, 20. Then the, once you, 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 uh, you detect it early, once you examine and we detect, so what will make us think uh, you have a breast cancer is when you feel a lump or a mass in your breast then you are further evaluated. Uh, to, it's not that every mass you feel means you have cancer, but you have evaluated and then the, if a diagnosis of cancer is made, then treatment is given to you according to uh, your clinical presentation, the stage in which you have reached. And uh, some of the things you also look out for, as mentioned earlier, is your breast. You must always, as a woman, look at yourself don't just look at your face in the mirror but you must look at your breast too in the mirror our breast is supposed to be almost of the same size that you don't see your left breast bigger than the right or vice versa so when you look and you find out that there's abnormal size there's a disparity in your breast size you should report it might not be anything but it's an early warning sign if you see that there are certain changes in your nipple, you should report. If you see discharge, you are not uh, lactating, you are not breastfeeding, and you are having discharge from your nipples, you should report to the hospital, especially even when it is bloody. And so uh, uh, it's bloody, you should report to the hospital. So in brief, this is what I have to say about breast cancer. And um, I'll pause here. So if you have any questions or comments, then the, we'll take it out from the uh, Dr. Ransford, Dr. Ransford, uh, has been uh, had to attend to a very, uh, he had an emergency and he had to attend to, he says he'll join us later. So I don't know whether he's been able to join, but Dr. Kwashi is not on as at now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Diana. Such a wonderful input on breast cancer awareness. I've learned a lot and I believe my um, colleagues have also learned a lot. Um, please, colleagues, let's give all the questions that's bothering us now um, to our special panelists to address them for us. If you want to talk, you raise your hand, then I will give you the opportunity to talk. Okay, I'll start with Ernest Chendu. But please, before he comes in, I would like to acknowledge um, uh, um, okay, that will be done um, very soon. Um, I take two questions and I would like Mr. Alfred to give us a small talk that we take the rest of the questions. Thank you. Okay, so over to NS Chendu, President. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please. Is it Chanchun or Chendu? We have two NS on the floor. I'll have to be specific. Uh, okay, Chen team president. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I thank you very much. I thank you, uh, the panelists who have just spoken. But I have three questions at a time. I hope I'll be permitted to ask, or I should ask only two. Um, okay, you can, you can summarize them for us, please. Okay. Now, please, the first one is on the uh, BCPs. Could you please share with us the BCPs that are common related or associated with the breast cancer? Because most women are used to the uh, BCPs because at the family planning, they are being also educated that they should use their BCPs. 
So we would like to know the common ones that you have come across during your uh, work site that have potential of causing the or uh, yeah causing the breast cancer. And then the second question is, you did not uh, share with us the order of examination of the breast. If a breast has um, a problem, and then the lady wants to and the lady wants to examine, which one should the lady start first? And then the third question is, the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding mothers, at what stage are not advisable for them to examine their breasts? Or at what time should they examine their breasts? Thank you very much. Yeah, so, um, hello? Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, I would answer for um, the, um, the how to examine the breast. And so if a woman is examining herself or wants to do the tough examination, or you want to know how your breast looks like, so you have to remove everything, your brazier, and then put your two hands on your waist and then look at yourself in the mirror. You can turn sideways or you can just stand straight in the mirror and you will see, you'll be able to observe whether one is bigger than the other or you can observe any changes, okay? Now, when it comes to the examination, when it comes to the examination, you have to... When it comes to the examination, you raise your left hand first or whichever hand you, 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 you'd prefer. So one hand has to go up because sometimes the, the, the lamp or the mask can be in your armpit. So you use your three middle fingers, okay? Your three middle fingers and then you start pressing all we, round from your armpit. See. Please, we can't see the pressing. Please, we can't see the okay. pressing. Yeah, we can't see, we can't see what is going on, yeah. <laughs> You see me in a bit, please. You want to see, please? Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. You want to see special. That's why we are here. Yes. Yeah, so, um, like I said, anyone you goes. So you raise, children. Raise, raise, you raise your left hand first. For me, you raise your left. Hand. Then you start okay. from the arm. So you start from the armpits. You start with your three middle fingers like this all round it depends on how hard you want to press okay so you'll be looking out for any lamp or mask or anything so as soon as there is a movement then you know that there is a lamp in your breast your your this thing your breast which can be found in the armpit or wherever so from the armpit you come down so we are doing it in a circular way so you, you wouldn't move your hand, though. The, the, the three middle fingers will be going like that, all round, all round, all round. Of course, if there's a discharge, if that is blasting or yellowish or any kind of form of discharge, you, you quickly what report to the nearest hospital for what diagnosis and what treatments. Okay. Then from that this side, you move to the other side, you raise your hand, the same thing, the three middle fingers in a circular motion or circular way, you move like that, then you come to the breast, you move like that all round, all round, you'll be pressing tightly, so you get to the nipple, you squeeze, and if there is any discharge that is blasting, you quickly would report for early diagnosis and treatment. Thank you. Well, thank you, doctor. The question about uh, 
So, concern, uh, which breast should you examine first? Uh, I usually in the hospital setting, we would examine the normal breast first, the one we think is normal. I, I, it might not even be normal at, at the end, but you examine the normal one before you examine the one we think is disease. Uh, but it doesn't matter if you are a woman and you see your, you, you think this breast has a problem. I don't think the one you examine first, uh, uh, bef uh, you examine uh, first matters. You can examine both, but usually when you come to the health professional, we would examine the normal breast before we examine the breast that we think has a, a, a mass or a lump or any problem with it. So that's what happens. And when you even think there is a problem, even when you examine and you feel that there is nothing, you should still go to the hospital. Once you feel anything wrong with your breast, you don't examine and say it's okay because you are not a professional. Even the professional, I can't examine my breast and just say it's okay. I also have to go for another professional to do it and then to, uh, assure me that everything is fine and even do some of the investigations like I mentioned the ultrasound scan or the mammogram. The other question about the BCP, what do you mean when you say BCP, please? That's birth control pills. Yes, so I just brought that because of abbreviations. Let's, let's be mind because B, B, uh, BCPs mean a lot of other things. So with the birth control pills, initially it was uh, 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 found out that uh, some of them uh, have a risk when you take it, you are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Those ones used to contain only estrogen, but now the ones we are having are not estrogen containing only. We have some that are uh, combination. We have both estrogen and progesterone. So I, I don't know which one causes the uh, 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 breast cancer because when it comes to the combined pills, research has shown that uh, it doesn't really uh, have that risk to developing breast cancer. But at first, they were given only estrogen pills, and that has been changed. So, so far as I'm concerned, and I practice in Ghana, uh, we use the combined pills, and the combined pills usually do not have, in, uh, have that risk. That's not that I know of. And that's Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay. Um, I saw... Um, uh, uh, Doc, I, I, I think it left oh. one of my questions. Yeah, which one? If you the, the, the pregnant women and the breastfeeding mothers. Yeah. The time yeah, for their breast... Um, to be examined. Yes. So for the pregnant women and the uh, uh, lactating mothers, usually in pregnancy, if you have any pregnancy to you, still have to examine your breast because it's even noted that when you have the cancer, it actually will manifest more during pregnancy. So pregnancy to you can, and so pregnancy, we talked about menses because during that time, most women feel tenderness in their breast. They have some people, their breasts become lumpy and you might pick up something and it might just be hormonal, just the hormonal changes there. But when it comes to pregnancy, every month you can still examine your breast and even pregnant women are not exempted from for coming for uh, the, the breast screening in this month. And for lactating mothers too, the same. And lactating mothers, uh, some, uh, when, once you start menstruating too, then it just applies. It's best you wait till uh, after your menses few days after your menses, then you examine the breast. And once you go for examination, it's important to indicate that you are lactating so that uh, the nipple discharge, if it's uh, the milk that comes out, nobody is really concerned and will evaluate you for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Doc. Doc, so the follow-up question for the uh, pregnant woman, is it advisable yes. for the person to go to the nearby clinic for uh, examination or the person to do so because during pregnancy there are a lot of i mean uh, uh changes in their breast yes. their dimpleness and then that may be misleading and the person may be, might have thought that 
he has got a problem. Yeah. So, on your advice on that. So, with pregnancy, every pregnant woman is supposed to be attending an antenatal clinic. So, some of these things they are being uh, uh, is being demonstrated during the antenatal sections. I know some antenatal clinics that have incorporated breast examination into it. So every pregnant woman can do the examination. Once you go for antenatal, talk to your midwife, talk to a doctor that you meet at the antenatal clinic, and then they would now examine and reassure you. But it is not for you to say that the changes are, is, uh, are due, uh, is due to your pregnancy, even though there are changes that are due to the pregnancy. If you is of concern to you, you have to report. And, and even when you are pregnant in this pink month, we still advise you to go for screening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doc. We will take a second question and we'll move to um, Doc, um, Mr. Fred for his skills consults presentation. Um, Ms. Lee, kindly give us your um, question. Thank you very much. Doc, please, you have been saying we should do the self-examination every month and then go to the hospital for screening or for examination. I've been doing it every month, but I remember I went to the hospital in Ghana for breast examination. The doctor was a man. He asked me if I can do it myself. I said yes. And he asked me to do it. He did not touch me. So in this case, do I have to go again or when I go, I have to look for a female doctor to examine my breast for me? <laughs> Hello. So if you present to the to hospital, <laughs> if you present to the hospital and then uh, you are coming for screening, every hospital has a place that uh, they do the screening. So maybe what the doctor should have done was to direct you, even if they were not doing it in their hospital. I don't know the conversation, what actually happened there. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to someone else to examine the breast for you. So some, every hospital has a screening place. So you don't wait, unless you have issues with it. Even when you get to the consulting room and the doctor feels that oh, this might not really be in a, this they might refer you to a screening place. Where I was working before I came to Kolebu, we were doing it at our maternity unit. So even when people come to me in the consulting room, sometimes because of how heavy the clean uh, OPD is, I, I just direct you to go to the maternity where they will have time and fully what uh, uh, distant examine your breast. Screening mm. is done there. Yeah, so you can still come and then the, you'll be redirected. So you tell them you want to screen. Sometimes you don't even need to take uh, 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 go through the whole process of joining the queue whoever you meet or the next you meet, while well, they are checking your vitals, let them know you are coming for breast screening specifically, and then you'll be directed as to what to do. At that time, I was even having some pains in my breast. That's why I went to the hospital, but he didn't touch me. Uh, he said I should do so, uh, yes, so I, I don't know what transpired, that one. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> comment on that. Hello, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Um, for sake of time, um, Mr. Fred is, will not be able to give us the input, but um, we have in our midst Dr. Um, Ransford Hoya Kwashi, um, medical, medical director at Doma East District Hospital. He's in our midst now, so um, let's give him the platform to give us his input on just in a brief um, moment to give us what he has for us. Thank you. Before we, we have a lot of questions here for our panelists, so <laughs> just a quick one. Thank you, doctor, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, please. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I just joined at the latter part. Uh, I think Dinah, a very good job. Thank you so much. Uh, I like to apologize. I'm unforeseen things. I'm the only one. I'm on call actually, so I couldn't make it on time. But um, generally, this is this issue is a very serious topic. And of late, um, where I am, I'm in a, a rural area, and 
this year alone, I have seen three cases of uh, breast cancer, which is, I mean, I should say it's uncommon. We do the usual fibroadenomas and stuff, you know, those biopsies. But, I mean, I saw one actually, which is a very rare type of cancer, inflammatory breast disease. Uh, which I, I, I was, it's, it's like one to three percent of uh, cases we find. And so I was alarmed. Um, a few, I think I had one other ductal carcinoma. Then we did a excision biopsy, and then when the result came back, they said it was a ductal carcinoma. I was in the early stage. And so I referred it. Um, it's like we are seeing an increase in those cases. And these people where I, I, I met or I've seen are less than 40 years old. So, <laughs> so it's, it's the source of worry for all of us. I mean, we know it's about between 50 and 70, you know, but now I'm seeing people who are less than 50 years. So it's very common types. They're very, uh, one was an uncommon type and then the other quite common. That's like a customer, it's, it's quite common. But I mean, it, it got me thinking and that's why uh, this one I have to be part. One of the, but I just want to look at the challenges that we have here in our setting that I think elsewhere you might not have, and so you should take advantage of the systems that you have. One of the challenges that we have here is the cost. You will not believe it that just for, I mean, something that will determine the cost of your life for the next five to ten years, you need um, 300. Ghana cities to 500 Ghana cities, or should I say 50 to 60 dollars to do the test? And it's not covered by insurance. I mean, it takes them like sometimes a whole month to come up with the money. You know, and by then, sometimes you give the sample to them to send it. And when they're coming for review, they tell you, oh, they didn't know it was that important. You know, sometimes I sign the, the, the consent form myself. Before I do it, I insist. I insist, sometimes they like to us that, oh, they've gone for the formal lane, they are just at the lab, they are going for the sample. Then I go into theater. When you come out, it's another story. Uh -huh. So the cost is one of the things which I think we have to do some more advocacy for them to add it to this health insurance thing. Or else it will become a very big challenge for us in, in the near future. And where you are, where if it's easy to get, there's some insurance cover that can easily if you have any issue with your breast, please make sure it's checked. Uh, it's, it's right now, the way things are taken out by surprise, I would really advise that the earlier, the better when it comes to breast cancer. Our, our poor health seeking behavior, that's what I've realized here. She has um, an ulcer on the breast, and so she takes it to some uh, guy in the, first, in the community. You know, maybe she's from a typical village, that's about some miles from here. So she takes it to the nearest person who has some health knowledge. And then he also, you know, gets some concoctions and puts them on it. And she eventually comes to you two or three months later with some simple ulcer, something that started like an ulcer, a scratch. Now it's a funcating wound and probably even changing and becoming metastatic, you know. And it's amazing. Some of the herbs that we apply, they actually, I think, haven't done research there, but it looks like they seem to fast track the process of getting them to uh, um, another phase or stage, the cells begin to change and before you realize, it, sometimes the whole, it's just you need to do a mastectomy for that kind of person. So now the cost will come in because I can't do it here. I don't have the, maybe the most that I can do is a chest x-ray and an ultrasound. They will need an MRI or something to look at it very and see what it is so that they can decide to go. And then now the cost factor comes back. No, initially, if it had just been dressed with some antibiotics and something, then we we'll know what to do. Maybe an IND at most. Uh -huh. And then they have so many myths about it. Um, you know, a, a whole lot. I, I've seen a few here, and <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh -huh. And this all boils down to the advocacy and sharing the information that we have. We need to, you know, we need to be the, the myth busters of our time when it comes to breast, breast cancer. And it, it's something that we have to take serious. And then our, our, our one other challenge, which I will just end with that one, that particular challenge, is our poor referral system. So wherever you are, if you don't have some of these issues, because I don't know, Dinah, 
was a Kolebu. And she knows the hustle and bustle. If I'm referring someone from my district hospital to Kolebu, it's like I've signed them a death sentence. If I don't know the consulting or a, an oncologist or attending a resident or something, that patient walks in there and it's like, it's a whole new world for them. You know, sometimes they just get to Kolebu. After the first time they meet somebody, they are back and they will never go again. The next time you see them, they are in respiratory distress, cancer has metastasized, and you can't touch them. You know, they spend all their money on other, other uh, um, treatment options, and it becomes a big deal. So the solution, one, we need to advocate. That, that one, we, we cannot emphasize on it uh, any, any less. We have to make so much noise about it. Recently, there was a debate about them adding cancer medication to uh, health insurance and all that. I mean, we are still far from reaching that place where someone with a breast lump can go and have comprehensive care, you know, and walk out with a five-year survival rate or more. When it's like in this country, when you're diagnosed, that is it. You know, we need to make more noise because it's not a common cancer that is affecting most women in this country. Uh -huh. Recently, I went for a funeral. Uh, a, a family I take care of in the community, their daughter passed from uh, breast cancer. And even our chief, one of our sub chiefs here, his daughter also died very young. And it's funny, all less than 45, all of them less than 45 years old. And it's killing them. And so we need to, I, I don't need to scare anybody, but we need to do more advocacy. Diana was talking about areas in her hospital previously where they used to do the breast screening. Now in Ghana Health Service, we have started um, putting up places called wellness centers where you can just walk in and do screening, you know, for whatever uh, test you want to do, um, hepatitis, um, uh, HIV, any kind of screening you want. Just walk in there so that you, you bypass this whole system of, you know, the health insurance is key to where you need to be sick to access care. But we're creating another area where you, even if you feel well, you just want to screen for certain diseases that might be asymptomatic at that time, you can walk in there. So we need to do more advocacy on that. So we can get the wellness centers everywhere. In the market, there should be a wellness center. I think it shouldn't just be in a hospital. So that a market woman just feels something you know, strange. You can just walk into the market, you know, and get it done. And the last thing I just want to talk about is us knowing ourselves. We need to know ourselves. As I mean, we need to, as she was saying, she went to the hospital, she had been doing her own examination. She felt a pain and then decided to visit. There are certain things some people don't really know. You ask them, one thing I realized, you ask them, when did they start? And they cannot really tell you that, you know, they say, oh, I check, you know, it's been, it's been a while. And we, we want specifics, you know, and it's a challenge for some people here. So I feel, I mean, most of us here are from, are back home here. Maybe we are just heading out there and we'll be back. I think we need to take this on a, a app, you know, and be advocates for this thing because it's becoming a, a, a big challenge for us so that we, we make sure every, a wellness center is in every location. You know, in a chips compound, there should be a wellness center. In the markets, there should be, and there should be a nurse trained who can do some of those basic things for them. And I think on the whole, we'll pick up most of these cases and we'll be able to handle them early. So at least that five year survival, you know, at least 95% to 100% survival, five year survival rates, we can achieve for everybody who's diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Fred and uh, his team for organizing this. It's been very exciting, even though I joined late. Thank you so much. Ed. All the best. Thank you. Was Beno Fuono, Ashama was Beno Fuono, Dike was Beno Fuono, She Akra was Beno Fuono, Umbuya Wuni, She No Fuono, Rasta for Beno Fuono. Okay, there was one question that was asked. Um, the the question was, how can men um avoid breast cancer? The question has missed me, so I just so please, our uh, panelists, can you help us with this question? The question is, 
how can men help in eliminating breast cancer? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um. Yeah, I think hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes, please, we can hello. hear you. Yeah, I, I was saying that um, you were asking how men can support in, you know, preventing or, you know, avoiding uh, women getting breast cancer. I think they can support, um, they can also support with the awareness creation by, you know, wearing the pink as well to let people know that it's important <coughs> to be doing the sports examination. Yeah, they can also put on the pink in the month of October to you know, create awareness, you understand. And they can also encourage their girlfriends and their wives to you know, examine their breasts once they are done with their you know, period or their menstruation. Because like um, Dr. Dan said, um, once you are menstruating or once you are ovulating, the breast becomes very heavy and tender. So you can't really tell if there is a mass you might be confused. So that is why we are stressing that at least some three days after your menstruation or a week after your menstruation, by then the breast would have been free. So you'll be able to detect if there is, the, there is a change or there is a mass in the breast. So I think the guys, and with the suckling too, it will help free the globules and all of that. So I think um, they can help in diverse ways here. Yeah. Yeah, and then I also wanted to add on to what um, doctor said about the pregnant women uh, breast being examined during A and C. Um, it's not only about the breast cancer, but also to inspect the kind of nipples uh, pregnant women have because um, some people have the inverted nipples, some have the puffy and you know very very huge nipples and stuff like that. So it's important to examine them whilst they are pregnant to be able to help them. For instance, if one has an inverted nipples, the, the, the pregnant woman will be what? Encouraged to what? Be pulling them with, you know, maybe share butter to help. So that when, once baby is out, baby can suckle. You understand? Uh-huh. And if you have an extremely, you know, bigger nipple, maybe you might be encouraged to what? Express the breast milk into a, a feeding bottle or a cup or something. You understand? So uh, the, the self-examination is very key here. So um, my guys and my men and my daddies, you can all help in one way or the other. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There is one Hello. question. Um, okay, well, I just want to add something to that. Just add on to the question. So I've realized that uh, most, there are a lot of chats coming in and looks like the guys are interested more in the suckling of their breast. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's what they are more interested in. The thing is that men too can get breast cancer, as I mentioned earlier, because you have breast tissue too, so you can get breast cancer. So you, it's just not about women alone. Even though women, we are 100 times raised than men, uh, the men, we have few men who have had breast cancer. So the men too, you have to watch your breast. Now, about the suckling, what happens is that uh, initially it was just uh, breastfeeding or suckling uh, is protective against breast cancer. Now, research has gone to prove that it's just not the suckling alone, but it's because when a woman is uh, actively breastfeeding, most women will have an ovulatory cycle. That means they do not ovulate over a certain period of time. time that is the main thing that is and that is what recent research is saying so it's just not about suckling so you want us to tell you to suckle your partner's breast we are not saying don't do it that one is left to you we don't we are not saying don't do it and there is no uh, proof to also show that men suckling their wife's breast or their partner's breast uh, uh, puts them at risk so you can suckle it but don't just don't be interested in suckling your partner's breast Know your partner's breast. If you say you're a man and you're a good partner, know their breast. 
sometimes you even be the first person to notice the changes and also advocate remind your mother every man has a mother if your mom remind your mother your aunties your sisters your girlfriends your husbands and even your classmates remind them to do their monthly breast examination and then also encourage them at least every year to go for breast screening if your mother is even uh, 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 this imposed menopausal some even recommend you can do it every six months so the men you have a big role to play in it thank you there's one question for um for the panelist what are some experiences you encounter Oh, okay. This question goes to Dr. Kwashi. As a medical director, what are some experiences you encounter on breast cancer among young people? Okay, so Dr. Yes, Kwashi. Um, yes. Yeah. Can you repeat the question again? Just, just, I didn't get the last part. Okay. What are some experiences you encounter on breast cancer among people or among young people? Oh, okay. Among young people. Yes, please. Yes, so as I was saying, um in my experience, uh, I as I was saying earlier, the the age I am seeing them now is quite lower now. We are looking at above 40. But when I realized, when I looked at it, they had some few risk factors. Uh -huh. And now our population, a lot of us are into these lifestyle, you know, things that predispose us. Because in the olden days, I mean, it was rare for a woman to drink, right? The alcohol, alcohol consumption, it was rare. But right now, and that's a modifiable risk factor, apart from the gen genetic part. We are not paying so much attention to our modify uh, the modifiable risk factors like your weight, your your diet, you know, alcohol or smoking. And one of the things that cuts through is that most of these women have uh, a history of alcohol intake, and from the data, I mean, it increases your risk of developing it. Uh, and um, obesity also has become so common, and you know, it's it's also it's also another risk factor. And so all these things, and I mean, at first, if you look at data from, if you go back to the 90s and you're coming down, you realize that it's increasing. And the ages are also, ages are people are coming up with breast issues are reducing. And you, when you just oppose this, you realize that it's just the lifestyle changes that are doing that. We don't even exercise. Look, we wake up in the morning, we're on our phone from morning, Instagram, and so we exercise the brain, all right. We have all this information, but we do not use it. So we are not really paying attention to the modifiable risk factors, you know, and these are the triggers. You can have the genetic bits, all right, but what will trigger it or bring it out will probably be the modifiable risk factors that you ignore, you know. And in Ghana, for me, I, I have a big challenge with, uh, uh, forgive me if, I, if, if I'm being a bit biased, but I mean, after a woman has given birth, she puts on weight, a lot of weight. So if she gives birth to like three or four, in, in a, maybe in 10 years, someone who used to be a very slim person is now obese. And we say, oh, my, you know, I've given birth to three or four children, so that is the excuse. And so it's causing more, more of them. And I'm seeing a lot of them even during ASD, maybe their fifth or fourth child having a complaint about the breast, you know, and some of these things, you can just see that they are put on so much weight, so much weight. From the first time you saw her to maybe a third pregnancy or a third child, she has put on so much weight. And when you ask, oh, somehow, you know, how I'm giving birth, and we forget that all these things, you know, impact on, on, on these lifestyle changes, impact on our risk of developing. As for the non modifiable one, I mean, you, you age, no matter what, you grow old. And it's more common in women. So definitely, as a woman, you have breast tissue. Definitely, you can develop breast, breast cancer. You know. uh, and you know, those genetic, other genetic factors. But for, for me, I think it's the modifiable risk factors. The youth are now taking 
to alcohol, smoking, and all that. And especially secondary smoking. Her boyfriend is smoking, and she's always in that crowd, always stepping out. And all that. So it's it's the whole challenge. But for me, that's what I've, I've realized. Thank you. Yes. yes. Hello. Mama, shama ma, aboti shama ma, shama ma, shama ma, shama Okay, then I'll, there's a question here. Um, should a woman be alarmed when fluid is coming out? If her breast, when expressed. So this question goes to all our panelists. Uh, anyone can yeah. address it for us, please. Um, okay, okay. So um, for for breasts, depending on the type of fluid that comes out, um, I'm sure when Diana was talking about all the signs and symptoms, um, if you express and it is bloody, right then. We, we we are a bit worried, uh, but there are some other conditions that will predispose you to, you know, having uh, like a prolactinoma or something that will predispose you to having galactoria when you are not breastfeeding. Uh, and I think bottom line is that once you see it, you get someone who has a clinical knowledge to have a look at it, and then they can help you. Uh, sometimes initially it's not. Uh, bloody or there's it's just uh, plain or just normal breast milk, you know, but or could be even yeah, an infection, uh, an infection mastitis that is producing some discharge from the breast. So you need to have it assessed. That's the most important thing. But it's more dangerous when it is bloody. That one usually will point to a, a cancer of the breast, most likely. It's not always you know, in all, 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 all uh, instances, but it could. Uh, so just get it done. That's the bottom line. Get a breast exam done when you see any kind of abnormality. Right. Hello, please. Can I be Chama was pen of one, the cave was pen of one, she a crab was pen of one, and we are winning shen of one, Rasta for pen of one, no for no mal, I'm so 
no fuo no o sha mama sha mama aboti sha mama sha mama sha mama eh ko di ko ko mo sha mama sha mama ala di sha mama sha mama sha mama please can i be heard hello Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Awesome. Please, there was one question. Um from okay, Sherry back now. So I'll give him the opportunity to ask his question. Sherry, please give your question. Ask your question, please. All right, thank you. Can you can you hear me, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh it's like uh listening to the uh, breast cancer awareness uh, panelists. Uh most of them, I think, basically all of them is indicated that um, after menstruate, uh, menstruation, right? After menstruation, you're supposed to examine yourself uh, yourself for um, lumps in the breast, okay? So I want to ask a question about, uh, what about the men, the women who are currently in the menopause stage? Like, they don't menstruate, right? So how would they, how, how often uh, would they need to, you know, check for the the, the lumps in the breast because they're not menstruating for them to do it right after the menstruation. That's my question. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. hello. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so they can select um, a day in, you know, every month. Okay, they can select a day in every month and then examine their breasts. Okay, that will be fine. They can they can just choose a day that will be appropriate for them and then examine their breasts since they have they are no longer menstruating. Yeah, and even some people give birth after a, a year before they menstruate, so they can also look for a particular day within a month. They can do it once in a month and then examine their breasts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. On this note, I would like to announce that um, the, um, Mrs. Valerie would have to leave us um, on a short um, duty. So thank you very much for your time. And it, it has been a wonderful uh, moment with you, um, Ms. Valerie. Thank you. So the next question is, if you have regular itching nipple, does that mean there might be something wrong? Please to uh, please the question again. The question Can is. Can you take the question? Yes, please. If you yeah. have a re if you have that itch yes. nipple, yes. does that mean there might be something wrong? Okay, so for itching nipple, I don't know whether uh, you have to uh, first of all look whether it's just the nipple alone that is itching because we have a lot of causes for itching in general. So maybe the person might have to even check the brazier you use uh, and, and then the, if the itching is very severe and then the, the something you, you can't uh, find any reason to it, I think you should go and then be checked and that will be, be uh, you'll be evaluated for the itching but itching is not known to be a sign or a symptom of breast cancer hello hello okay yes i, I hope i was Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, yes, finally. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was just so saying just that itching like is that. not a, a, yes, a symptom of a breast cancer. However, if you are having the itching, you have to check. It will be as a result of the brazier or something you are using that is irritating and then you're having the cancer, the itching. It will also even be due to some of the cosmetics that you use. That you are itching. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Find out whether the itching is just only around your nipple or it's other parts of your body. Uh -huh. But it is not a known uh, symptom or sign of uh, breast cancer. Itching can 
be any other uh, 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 condition, like systemic condition, or it could be local, depending on what you are applying there. Uh -huh. So if the itching worries you so much, I think you should just go to the hospital and then you'll be evaluated. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Dr. Kwashi can add on. Yes. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Diana. In, in my experience, what I realized is that some, some come with inflammatory breast conditions and their initial um, symptom that they complain about is itching of the breast, localized itching. Some, some, uh, usually around where the uh, inflammation eventually appears. So I would just say that for me, it's an early warning sign for other breast uh, conditions, not necessarily cancer, which is important. We get, as Diana was saying, care um, a bit early. Uh -huh. if, if you start antibiotics early for something like that, maybe it will start with an itch, and then you realize the place is a bit reddish. If you start antibiotics early, I mean, you get better quickly and you don't develop any other complications like an abscess. Uh, so for the itching, it's not, as she said, it's not a specific uh, symptom, uh, sign or symptom for um, cancer, but then other inflammatory breast conditions, it is. So just let's always try to seek early attention for that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's 10-4. And we'll take our last question of the day. Um, the question is, if a woman has cancer and I don't know, and I suck too much, can the cancer enter my mouth? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> this, this one I've never... I, mean, I think I have to do research on this one, but uh, <laughs> um, this is I, I think before, before, yeah, before you, it will be, uh, should I say, cancer becomes um, easily spreadable or metastatic. Definitely some signs will, pick, will, will come out. Some breast pain, or you know, some bleeding from the nipple or something, or some nipple retraction, or you feel a mass. And I don't know why I would like to, uh, suck on a, on a breast that is painful or swollen or, or tender or has a funny discharge, you know, emanating from the nipple. Uh -huh. So it would, it's, it's not, I've never come across such a thing, but I mean, you see signs, if it's cancerous, there will definitely be signs. There are a few cancers here that are a bit subtle, uh -huh. but I doubt you can get uh, that kind of cancer. You can, you can pick up uh, cancer just like that. I, I, I don't know so much about that research, but then I, I have never had a case like that. But in medicine, we never say never. Uh -huh, just that. It's, it's highly unlikely, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Diana, please. Okay, so to add to that, uh, hello, I just want to add to her, Dr. Kwashi just said, uh, so far from my reading, I've not come across that. And then uh, breast cancer is not a, uh, let me say, it's not a communicable disease. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't mean when you touch it, when you touch the cancer or you taking the cancer, uh, uh, this thing, you, you, you get the cancer. I, I don't know about that and I doubt. But as you said, in medicine, there's nothing, uh, can not say never. Um, but however, I also, he has mentioned it. If you see a breast that is really discharging and has a, like a full blown breast cancer, I don't think you even suckle that breast. Uh -huh. But if it is not showing yeah. anything, there are no symptoms, it looks normal, but the uh, woman has breast cancer, you, you won't get breast cancer from that because it's not a communicable disease. So it's not like you spread through contact once you have this or this. No, we went through the uh, risk factors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, even I said it's last question, but there's one question that caught my attention here. I would like it to be touched. Can too much hair around the nipple cause breast cancer? Hmm. Okay, not that I know of. I've not come across that. 
I don't know if Dr. Apache has come across that, but I don't know mm, about that. No, and I don't think no, uh, I don't think it causes breast cancer. Okay. Uh, Thank you. No. I... Okay. Hello. This... Okay. Um, Doctor Pashi. Yeah. Um, I think Diana has just. I've never come across that. Um, maybe she has. Uh, maybe uh, her sexism or something that might cause some. Uh, maybe uh, changes in her. You know, uh, how do you call it? Her hormones and all that, and maybe you see she's a bit hairy, you know, on the chest or around the nipple. But I don't think it has any direct implication with with uh, breast cancer. Uh, maybe that person might have a risk factor. Maybe uh, because of the hesitation, uh, maybe that has issues with conception. And maybe might predispose the person. But uh, that just hair around the person's nipple is not. I wouldn't call that a, a risk factor. No. Thank you. Something must kill a man, no. For your back, I'll be dying. But please, sometimes there's a follow up question. Sometimes the hair around the nipple cause. How about that? Please repeat that again. Um, sometimes the hair around the nipple caused um, itching. So how about that? Aha. Uh -huh. So, you know, we're saying that itching is not directly uh, linked to breast cancer. Uh -huh. It could be another inflammatory disease, so inflammatory condition of the breast. So um, it's just advisable that we get to look at it. But another thing too is when you are, sometimes people are tempted to shave it off or, you know, kind of, Get final other means of getting it off. You can develop an inflammatory condition of the breast from that, mm. uh, but not necessarily uh, breast cancer. Definitely, and easily you can you could easily get an infection easily, easily if you, if you uh, for colitis or other things that can even get even more difficult to give you an abscess. So you just have to be careful with it. But it's not a direct uh, risk factor or cause. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Diana, uh, please. Hello. Hello. Dr. Diana. Yes, oh, please. I, I don't have anything to add to what Dr. Pashi has said. All right. Thank you so much, um, the panelists. On this note, um, we bring the program to an end, but would like to take a closer remark from um, Mr. Emmanuel Thompson, Shanghai chapter president. Something must kill a man. Something, something must kill a man. Am I being heard? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our online health discussion, and it is it is it is my task to provide this closing remark. To be frank, this is a sad task because we are just closing the door on our lifetime discussion and a topic that most of you, the guys, really love. However, it's a privilege for me to undertake this amazing task. I will start by thanking God Almighty true looks for bringing this discussion to a bed. Also, I would thank all the keynote speakers and the panelists, as well as our active participants. You have done an outstanding job for sharing with us your valuable knowledge, insight, and experience on mental health and breast cancer awareness. Thank you very much. I know you've learned a lot, but I'll just point out on three things that I learned from this online discussion. One, we are advised to get close to our neighbors when we notice any unusual changes in them so that we know what to do next. Two, especially with our ladies or women, you have to make sure to look at your breast often as possible in order to see if there's any changes on that. Third, thirdly, and last but not least, men 
can also get cancer. However, we can also bring or uh, educate people on this awareness by wearing pink uh, dress, especially in this season, and also circling the breast of our partners. I'm talking about the married ones. <coughs> <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank our own Honorable Irene and Wukong for organizing such an amazing event and ensuring it runs so smoothly. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, you, I know that we have a long evening and most of us are looking forward to get on our bed and some are looking forward to go back to their normal activities. So I would like to once again take this opportunity to thank you all very much and wish all of us sweet night, amazing night, and those in Ghana, have a wonderful day. God bless us all. God bless you. Thank you very much. Again, please, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I would like to personally thank all our dear panelists showing up on today's um, discussion. It has really been an awesome night. And especially my very big thanks to um, Mr. Fred. He has really been of help. God really, God richly. Okay, so let's take her over. Closing prayer from uh, Enin, the um, Jejian chapter. Okay, please, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, then let's pray. Our dear Father God, we thank you so much, and we approach your throne of undeserved kindness this night with humility. We are really grateful for the wonderful things you've taught us through our resource personnel. We have learned a lot. We ask for protection for, from you, but we know that because we are living in this um, satanic world, anything can happen. And that is why you've taken up the task to teach us through these wonderful people. All what we ask is that you help us so that whatever we've learned, we put into practice. Then we consider and be alert of the promptings so that we will not be found wanting, but rather make a good decision even before something bad starts. We are very much appreciative also for NEC and Nuke China. We stay here in China, we are far from home, but we live as a family. We are very grateful and we know that you are our father. We pray that you continue to keep us closer to each other through programs such as this. And then you continue to uh, teach us so well. And then you also give us humble hearts to learn whenever you teach us. As we depart from here, we ask for protection from you that you continue to protect us all in China so that next time when there is a program like this, all of us can join happily and learn a lot from it. We humbly request all this through Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Shama ma, shama Nasa Ligobe, I'm going to suck up like Rose, so you go make flat, go say, say no full power, shake it, hey, Nasa Ligobe, I'm going to suck up like Rose, so you go make flat, go say, yeah, no, 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 no,
Fuck. <laughs> <laughs>